invite our plenary speaker, Professor Simchilini, uh, to take the stage. And uh, um, I also want to take this opportunity to welcome Professor Narayan, um, who is one of our program chairs, who has done an outstanding job, and it's really my pleasure to uh, uh, hand over uh, this session for him to decide. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a great honor to introduce uh, Professor Sinchi Levy. Um, it's, in fact, it's a great, his talk is a great transition from uh, the Applied Research Challenge Award, uh, looking at rigorous and relevant research. Um, Professor Sinchi Levy, most of us know him uh, very well. I uh, just want to give a brief introduction to his uh, bio. He's a professor of engineering systems at MIT, and he's the chairman of Ops Services. Uh, it's an operations analytics consulting company and operatics. It's a cloud uh, analytics platform. Uh, he's one of our thought leaders in uh, supply chain management and business analytics. I, I wouldn't say any more. Uh, we, we have about 45 minutes, and I, I certainly would hand over the floor to him so we can hear him. <coughs> example of the impact that our community can make uh, on OM practice. So what I'm going to do is talk about data-driven research um, in revenue uh, management. And let me start by um, describing the environment that allowed us to do uh, this type of work. At MIT, I lead a center for business analytics uh, that is uh, sponsored by Accenture and some other companies. Um, and our focus is on developing uh, solutions to some of the most challenging problems that either Accenture uh, is facing or some of the partner companies um, face by bringing together data, models, and analytics. Um, the center is cost industry. We have companies in oil and gas, retail, financial services, uh, um, uh, industrial equipment, government, and it is cross-functional. Some of the projects focus on revenue optimization, some focus on predictive maintenance, other on uh, social uh, media uh, or process optimization. You can see examples here of some of the companies involved. Uh, for instance, uh, you have here uh, Starwood, one of the largest hotel chain in the country, Ryanair, um, P&G and Unilever, Ericsson, uh, Excel, uh, which is an insurance company, Exxon Mobile, uh, and Shell. So you get a sense of a variety of companies involved in our uh, effort. At any point in time, we have about a dozen of projects running in, uh, running in parallel. Um, on this list, I split the project into um, four categories. When I talk about each project, think about a combination of uh, a faculty, one or two PhD students, and a company involved in such a project. And so if you look at this uh, slide, Foundation uh, include projects like linking analytics to business performance. Uh, the list uh, examples include a couple of projects, one of which is developing a new way for an insurance company to assess risk in its portfolio. Um, a third category is retail, for instance, the impact of social media on our ability to improve demand forecasts. And the last category here is industrial operation. Uh, examples include uh, optimization or optimizing capacity and service level uh, for a large high-tech manufacturing company. Um, the bottom one that you see here is improving mining operation by uh, our algorithm receiving uh, data from about 1,000 of sensors every five seconds and trying to uh, suggest how to improve um, operations. 
Uh, today, um, I am uh, going to focus on three examples um, uh, in the retail space, focusing on learning and optimization. And so, uh, my focus on all the examples is on the online retail space. This uh, industry has been growing um, at a rate of about 10% per year over the last few years. Last year, it was a $300 billion uh, uh, industry, and this number does not include um, sales of uh, online sales of brick and mortar retailers like uh, Walmart. Uh, the three companies that I will talk about include uh, Grupo, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, Rulala, um, an online uh, retailer in the flash sale industry. With a show of hands, how many are familiar with Rulala? Many. Uh, and I don't think many are familiar with B2W. B2W is the largest online retailer in Latin America, in Latin America, about $20 billion uh, retailer. Uh, all these companies um, have uh, additional information compared to uh, brick and mortar retailers. They have information about customers making on the fly, buying or buying decisions. Questions we are going to ask, can we use this information to uh, improve uh, business performance? And so I will uh, focus on three stories. The first is the Rula last story, where we focus on forecasting and optimization. And, and the idea here is, is the following. I'm introducing a new product to the market. The selling season is very short. How can I generate the initial forecast and an effective price to maximize the business performance? The second one is Drupal. As I will explain later on, in the case of Drupal, it's very difficult to generate a reliable forecast. As a result, I will focus on learning on the fly, understanding consumer behavior, and therefore pricing the product effectively. And the third, the third story is uh, the story of bundling. I learned about bundling by collaborating with B2W. In the case of bundling, we will focus on um, two aspects. How do you price bundles? That's a challenging question. And can you learn from bundles about consumer valuation? And finally, I will summarize with a few observations, uh, at least uh, my experience on data-driven uh, research. And so let me start with the Rulala uh, story. Rulala is in the flash sales industry. In this industry, retailers offer deep discount for a short period of time uh, during, uh, in the case of Ulala, an event that lasts about 48 hours. This event uh, lasts about 48 hours, they offer deep discount, and they try to uh, maximize business performance. This uh, industry started in the mid-2000, and it's growing a little bit faster than the online retail space in general. There are a number of competitors in the US. Hulala is based in uh, Boston. Zuli is another competitor, same space, based in Seattle. Gilt uh, is based in New York. The company was recently acquired. You have here a Spanish uh, company that is very successful. There is a Chinese company in the same space, extremely uh, uh, successful. If you go on Hulala website, you will see something like this one. Um, you will see that they are running a couple of events in parallel. Uh, here on the top left hand side, they are selling classical watches, jewelry is in a different event, um, men running shoes, women running shoes. And uh, for each event, the website will emphasize the amount of time uh, remain until the end of the event to uh, generate a sense of urgency. Suppose you are interested in women running shoes, you will click on that event. And you will see the available style. In this case, there are three styles. The, for each style, the website will highlight Rulala price. And on uh, the left hand side, you will see another price, which is the recommended price by the, by the manufacturer. And the idea is to suggest a, a signal, a message that this is not only limited time, but it's a very aggressive, uh, very aggressive price. And so uh, once you are interested, if you are interested in a specific style, you click on that style, you see the available sizes, and you make buy your buy decisions. Operations 
um, in, for all the home, for all the flash cell um, retailer is very simple. The merchant will decide uh, what item to purchase, typically from fashion designers like Louis Vuitton or Ralph Lauren. Uh, the item will arrive at the warehouse. Then they need to decide when to sell, which event to use, and at what price. Typically, they use cost plus, right? very simple pricing strategy. And uh, this is the first event where they sell the product. If they sold the entire inventory, that's great. If not, then the leftover inventory will stay at the warehouse for six, seven, maybe eight months until the next time they sell the product. And the reason they have to wait for a long time is because the manufacturer, the fashion designer, do, designers do not want their product to be discounted too frequently. And so it's important to optimize performance during uh, first exposure. But this is very difficult because this is the first time you sell the product. And so initially when we were uh, uh, discussing a project with them, the focus was on inventory optimization. Uh, but the data told us that there is a completely different opportunity uh, with uh, this uh, uh, company. And so uh, uh, the first question we are asking is uh, how do they do during first exposure, right? And so on this slide, I show data from five different departments. On the X coordinate, we show sales room. What is sales room? This is the percentage, percentage of inventory sold during first exposure. And the Y coordinate represents the frequency that they achieve this level of uh, of uh, sales room for each one of the departments. So let's take an example. Look at the blue bar on the right hand side. This represents department five. This suggests that in 62% of the cases, for department five, they sold out. This may not be great. What you really want is to sell everything but one unit. Because if you sold everything but one unit, you know, no money is left on the table. And so the opportunity here is maybe the price was too low and we can optimize on price. And on the left hand, the left hand side you see the reverse problem. So look at department two, the red bar here represents department two. This slide suggests that in 22% of the cases, for department two, they sold almost nothing, which may suggest that the price was too high. And all of a sudden from a discussion around inventory, we are focusing on um, price optimization. But the question is, what data do we have to optimize price for products that we never sold before? And so we develop a two-step process that include demand forecasting and price optimization. You hear about that and you tell yourself that there is nothing new here. Everybody that wants to optimize price needs to start with demand forecast, except that the demand forecast here is a little bit different. And the reason it's a little bit different is because of two challenges. The first challenge is I'm trying to forecast products that I never sold before. And the second uh, challenge is I really don't have information about demand. The only information that I have is uh, about sales uh, for product where we stop out, demand may be much higher than sales, but we don't know how. And so uh, focusing on the demand forecast, we use um, clustering techniques to learn from those items that did not stock out about items that did uh, stock out. And we use all the data to develop uh, an effective product forecast. In this effective forecast, we bring together, uh, and you will see it a lot of time in business analytics, we bring together internal and external data. Internal data that Ulala has together with external data coming from other sources. Let's look at the data. Uh, we start with a product, uh, for a specific product, which department, for example, women shoes, which class, for example, women running shoes, um, color popularity, the distribution uh, of demand uh, according to color, uh, size popularity, these are all internal uh, data. External data is information about how popular a specific brand is. Then we look at price discount relative to the manufacturer price. Um, all the competing product sold by uh, Rulala 
at the same time and the uh, corresponding prices and the timing of the event. And very uh, quickly, after comparing the task with different uh, forecasting techniques, you realize that traditional uh, forecasting techniques, for example, like linear regression, do not work well. What works well um, in our case is regression tree or a more advanced version of regression trees like random uh, forecast. So, what are uh, regression trees and why are they so effective? Regression trees are really a collection of rules that if you follow the rule, it tells you at the end of the uh, process what the forecast is, what the forecast is. So suppose we are focusing on a specific product, we start at the top. If uh, this says it's a price of this product that you are trying to uh, predict is less than 100, move to the left. Um, in this case, we arrive at this node. Here at this node, we compare the price of the product we are trying to uh, predict to the average price of all competing products sold by Rulala at the same time. If this rate, if the ratio between the two is less than 0.8, we move again to uh, the left, and the prediction in this case is 50 units. The sense that you get, uh, the regression tree can be uh, very complex with many, many different levels uh, incorporating different uh, sets of uh, of rules. And the, for, and the next question is why regression trees um, turn out to be uh, very effective? For two, uh, we believe for two reasons. The first reason is regression, tree, regression trees are very good at looking at a new style that I never saw before and identifying from the historical sets similar styles for which I can predict customer demand for the new style. And the second, uh, regression tree allows for non monotonic uh, pricing and relationship. What you find a lot of time for a uh, fashion product is uh, that price is a sign of quality. As you increase price, you increase uh, demand within a certain range, and you want to take uh, advantage of this relationship. Um, once we develop uh, the demand forecast, the next question was. Um, how do we optimize price? When you optimize price, there are two challenges. The first challenge is that the demand for this product that we are trying to price depends clearly on its price, but also on the price on the prices of all competing products sold by uh, Lulala. So we need to optimize all of them at the same time. And the second challenge that you have is that I don't have a simple function that I can incorporate in my model to uh, um, indicate the relationship between demand and price. What I do have is a collection of rules or stories that give me uh, an insight about customer demand. And so um, what we did, we developed a mixed integer program that takes into account the different uh, business rules that comes out of the uh, regression trees. And we incorporated, integrated our technology within Ulala ERP. Uh, here is what we did. This is the Ulala ERP system. Every night we suck in data about the products that are going to be sold tomorrow uh, to the optimizer's database. The, the, this database is used by R to generate regression tree. We uh, incorporate inventory information into the regression tree to make sure that if demand is greater than inventory, then we cut at the level of, of uh, the inventory, and then we uh, input the regression trees into our mix integer program. We solve it to optimality, and we generate, typically after 45 to an hour, um, prices for all the products sold by the company. In the morning, the merchants come, they look at all the products that they are responsible um, for, and they can uh, override our recommendations. Our experience, and I'll tell you about the field study in a second, was that they typically approve 95 to 97% of the recommendations. In the cases where they overlap, where they reject the recommendations, typically it's because they found that there is another uh, online retailer that sells the same exact product at a lower price, and for many or some product categories, the company wants to be the lowest price provider in the market. And so the question was how effective this is. 
we did initially a lot of um, offline analysis, and at the end, um, we were ready for a field experiment that lasted uh, six to seven months. Um, and there were two objectives to the field uh, uh, experiment. One, of course, what is the impact on performance? What is the impact on, on um, revenue? But the second, and you will see uh, this in every project I will talk about, uh, nobody in the online space is interested in improving revenue or improving budget if the end result is a reduction in market share. And so, especially when you increase the price, online retailers want to know that there is no negative effect on market share. And so this was the two objectives in our study. Um, we started the field experiment at the beginning of 2014. We identified, because of this objective, 6,000 sites where the tool recommended price increase. We divided all these sites into five categories according to price point. And then for each category, uh, we split them into two groups. Uh, the control group, where um, Ulala use cost plus, and the treatment, where um, we use our algorithm, meaning they use the automated system that we uh, developed. And so the first objective was to understand impact on market share. We answered that question by focusing on the sales group. So the, the um, white coordinate represents the sales group across all the categories. The X coordinate represents the five categories arranged according to price. Category A includes all the style with the lowest price point. Average price is about 50 bucks. The um, category E um, includes the style with the highest price point. Uh, blue represents performance of the control. Uh, red represents performance of the treatment. You can see that except for category A, we increase the price and there is no negative effect on market share or on sales group. We had a problem with category A. I will come uh, back to how we solved it. Uh, what was the impact on revenue? Um, excluding for a second category A, we increased revenue for category B by about 11%. The same amount for C, uh, almost 15 or 13% for D and 20 plus percent for E. We changed our algorithm because what we found for category A, the algorithm was too aggressive, um, increasing price too much. And so for price point of about 50, we put a constraint that you cannot increase the price by more than five bucks, and that solves the problem. Even with this problem, uh, our uh, field experiment over six or seven months showed uh, about 10% uh, improvement, improvement in revenue, and this improvement goes straight into uh, bottom line. And so uh, this is a story uh, really about generating a single uh, forecast at the beginning of the selling season and then using it to optimize performance. The group on story is different. You work with Google, you realize it's extremely difficult to generate a reliable and effective forecast. So we need something else, and that's the learning uh, process that I will uh, talk about. And you will see that when I talk about B2W, I also will talk about learning, but I will talk about learning in a completely different way. And so uh, focusing on uh, Groupon, uh, this is one of the largest online daily uh, de uh, deal retailer. Um, they operate in more than 600 cities. They have uh, more than 50 million um, customers. Um, they sell thousands of new deals every day. Uh, they, uh, it's very difficult to predict customer uh, demand, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, they collect a lot of sales data, but they really don't use it to adjust price. They used before us, they used to use fixed price policy, just the same price um, over uh, the selling season for a specific product. Product life cycle is relatively short. And by this I mean the following. Uh, a product will stay on their main website for four days. At the end of day number four, um, you can buy the product, but it's moved to a secondary page. Uh, it's more difficult to find the deal that was introduced four days ago. And so it's very important for them, similarly to Ulala, to optimize the performance during the first four days, and that's what I'm going to uh, to focus on. 
sort of said, uh, very quickly we realized uh, we cannot generate an effective um, demand forecast like what we did in the case of Ola, so our approach was completely different. We started by generating a collection of demand functions, uh, any demand functions. I'll tell you a little bit more about the detail. What is demand function I? Demand function I is really the probability that the customer will purchase the product at price P, right? And you can see here on the right hand side three linear uh, demand functions. So we are generating this collection of M demand functions. We are assuming, and like any academic, uh, we need to make some assumptions that allow us to get some technical results. So we are assuming that uh, uh, one of these demand functions is a true demand function, uh, but we don't know which one it is. Of course, when you think about Google, you immediately have many questions. How do I generate the demand function? How large or small should M be? Should, should the number of demand functions be? And the last question is, how do you know that the two demand functions is one of these demand functions? I'll, I'll talk about this question in a second. But that's the process, completely different than the work that we focused on for, uh, for uh, and uh, once we had that collection of demand functions, we basically used a sequential process where we, um, during the first four days, initially, initially, we learn about uh, customer demand during a period of T1, uh, units of time, when I need to optimize on T1. Once I learn enough about customer demand, I switch to the final price. You understand immediately the, the trade-off that I have here. If I learn for a long period of time, I will have a good understanding of customer demand, but I don't have enough time to optimize. On the other hand, if I learn for a short period of, of time, I will have an approximate understanding of customer demand, but I have a long time to uh, optimize. And so part of what the algorithm has to do is to decide how long to learn and how to learn. Right? So I will allow you to is extremely simple. In fact, it cannot be simpler than what I'm going to describe. The way it works is as follows. We start with a learning price P1. We observe sales during the learning period, and we ask which one of the M demand function is the closest to approximate that level of demand in expectation. <coughs> Suppose this is demand function I. I use demand function I as if it was the true demand function and, and price the product accordingly by selecting the price, maximizing P times G of P. Very simple algorithm, right? And so uh, a, a few uh, business constraints that uh, we need to identify. But before identifying the business constraint, uh, let me tell you uh, what can we say about this uh, algorithm. Um, suppose during the selling uh, horizon end customers alike, if you use fixed price like what uh, Groupon has been using uh, for uh, a long time, then we can show that the regret is linear with the number of customers. What is the regret? The regret is the difference between revenue achieved by Norfolk, who knows the true customer demand, and the regret achieved by uh, any and the revenue achieved by our algorithm. So, so uh, the question is, what does your learning algorithm do? If you use one learning price, we can show that you can cut the regret from linear with n to log of n. What about if we use more than one learning price? Suppose we use k learning prices. Uh, we can show that in this case, meaning I use one price, I learn, I use another price, I learn again, and so forth and so on. If we can show that if you use k learning price, the regret uh, goes down to log 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 of n iterated k time. The beauty of this result is that there is a matching lower bound, which means that you cannot do better than the result that I show you with k learning prices, or alternatively, the regret of n is directly proportional to log 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 of n iterated uh, k time. And so, uh, Groupon is uh, looked at our results and they said there is an important insight here. And what is the insight? The insight is that the first learning price has the biggest impact and everything after that uh, shows a decreasing marginal return. And so Groupon was concerned about confusing their customers and they said 
um, we allow you to use only a single level price after they've just reached to the final price. But they emphasize there are many other business constraints that you need to deal with. Here is one that says that the initial price, uh, the level price, is not a price I can select. It's a price negotiated between Groupon and the vendor. So this is just an input to our algorithm. The second is the window of prices is very small. Basically what this says, if your algorithm recommends increasing the price, Groupon will not be interested. If the algorithm recommends a decreasing price less than 5%, don't change price. If the algorithm in fact recommends a decreasing price more than 30%, cap it at 30%, you can see that the opportunity is relatively uh, small. And then they said, uh, keep in mind that the merchant gets a fixed share. What does this mean? Look at the, look at the deal on the right hand side. Um, under the current price, you, uh, they, they sell a coupon for 17 bucks. This 17 bucks is split between the restaurant and the group home. In this split, the restaurant gets 10 bucks. Suppose uh, the algorithm comes back with a reduction in uh, price from 17 to, to 15, then the restaurant still gets um, 10 bucks. Uh, group home share goes down. And so from the restaurant point of view, from the vendor point of view, decreasing prices is very attractive because it increases traffic to uh, the website and to the, the product, but this may be a problem for Groupon, right? And finally, um, Groupon asks, so how do we generate the demand function? And so uh, we use the following uh, process. Um, we started by uh, testing dynamic pricing on thousands of deals. For each one of the deals in the uh, test set, we use two prices, observing demand, and then developing just a simple linear demand function. So think about uh, a database that includes thousands of, of deals, associated with each deal is just a linear uh, demand function. Now comes uh, a new deal, right? Uh, with initial price P1 negotiated between Groupon and the, and the vendor. So what we do, we look at the new deal, and the new deal and we um, select from the historical uh, set deals with similar features, same category, same discount, same town, same city. And so when we look at the new deal, we generate say 500 similar, uh, similar deals. And now we apply caning clustering to select the specific demand function. How do we do that? For each one of the 500 or 600 similar deals, um, we use two dimensions. The X coordinate is the demand for a specific historical deal at the initial price P1 agreed to for the new product. And the Y coordinate is just the slope. And I uh, apply caning clustering, for example, with K equal to three, um, it generates three clusters. The center of gravity of each cluster is by itself a demand function. These are the demand functions that we selected. We developed this black box, we gave it to Groupon, and we focus on k equal 10, and we were waiting for the good news, but the new good news never happened. In fact, when they called us, they said this is uh, much worse than what we are doing with our fixed pricing policy, we are fairly certain about our algorithm, uh, but not about K, and so we decided to use a cross-validation to identify exactly what K should be. So remember, I have thousands of deals in my database, uh, each of which is associated with two prices, P1 and P2, and the demand under each one of them, right? And of course, the corresponding linear demand function. So I'm splitting all these thousands of deals into training 80% and testing 20%. Each deal in the testing set is considered like a new deal that I need to price. So for this new deal, as I mentioned, I have four pieces of information, P1, P2, demand under P1 and demand under P2. So uh, first, I apply my k clustering for different values of k to generate the function. And so I apply the black box, say is k equal 30, and I generate 30 demand function. 
And then I apply my learning algorithm to see what is the accuracy of our model. And the way we do it is as follows. Applying the learning algorithm, I know the initial price P1, and then I ask the learning algorithm to determine which demand function is the closest to approximate that level of sale with uh, the price P1. Let's say it's demand function I. I plug in P2 into the I. This will be what my algorithm believes the demand will be under price P2. I know what the demand was under price P2, and I can compare the two. And we use two performance metrics from Groupon. One is what we call, uh, what they call QPM, or quantum compelling pressures, which is, think about this as just the probability of purchase. And the other one is BPM, or book impairing pressure, which is uh, something proportional to expected revenue, QPM times price. And so we tested the, the prediction accuracy as the function of the number of demand functions. The x coordinate represents k, how many demand functions are we using? We are using, and the y coordinate represents mean square error. The left hand side is BPM error, the right hand side is QPM error, and you, will, you see why we failed. When we selected k equals 10, it was the largest possible error, but when we switch, uh, to 100 with significantly reduced error. If I increase K more than 100, say to 200 or 300, error will go up because of uh, overfitting. And so we focus on, depending on the specific, between 90 to 100 demand functions. Google applied our algorithm to five other categories, beauty, food, uh, leisure, services, and shopping. By the way, the, two, the first two are the largest in terms of revenue for the company. Um, they looked at two performance measures. The first is booking, which is a proxy for market share. What is booking? Booking is total revenue collected by Groupon, independent of whether it stays with Groupon. You can see we did very well uh, for beauty, increasing booking by more than 140%. We did well in food, uh, increasing booking by 100%. Leisure, 60%. Service, by 80%. And more than 300% for shopping. The second measure was revenue. What is revenue? Revenue is what stays with Groupon. It's booking minus what they transfer to the vendor. We do very well in beauty. We do well in food. We are neutral in services. We do very well in shopping. We had a problem um, in leisure. And so uh, we recommended to the company not to use our algorithm for leisure. And the problem for leisure for us, it's very hard at least from our point of view, um, to scale for the, to normalize the impact of time. Because for leisure, typically people buy a meal today for a trip two months or three months from now. The time effect is very difficult to incorporate in our model. And so this brings us to the last uh, part of the uh, presentation where I am going to focus on environment. And when I, uh, when, uh, I did a lot of work for uh, B2W um, on pricing the product, uh, what you find one of the most challenging areas is prices of determining price for, uh, for bundle. And then you find very quickly uh, uh, two things. Two, you can make two observations. The first observation that you can make is uh, that companies bundle product that should not be bundled. These are products where the demand are positively correlated. Bundle does not really help you. Where bundles have a magic, where bundles have a magic is where the valuation of the demand are completely independent of each other. That's where otherwise you cannot achieve the same performance as you will achieve under bundle. And so I'll talk here about two aspects of bundles. The first is pricing bundles. Right? And the second is learning from bundles. And let me explain um, the learning just for a minute. Uh, as you will hear from uh, the story of Groupon, uh, there is a lot of resistance um, from online retail to experiment with this price because they are worried that um, this will confuse consumers. What I will show here is that without experimenting with price at all, 
just looking at sales of bundles, we can learn about consumer evaluation and as a result uh, implement uh, a future price strategy for other uh, products uh, later on. So what is the magic of um, uh, bundling? Suppose we have two uh, products with IID uh, valuation. Um, for instance, suppose the valuations are either one with probability of one half or two with probability of one half. In this case, uh, when you price them independently, it's very simple. If I price at one, then people will buy with probability one. If I price at two, people will buy with probability of one half. Expected revenue is one, and so no matter what I do, what I do, expected revenue is one. If I have two products, my total expected revenue is two. One way to think about this question is to look at the graph on the right hand side. On the X coordinate, I have the price. On the Y coordinate, I measure the probability that the customer valuation is greater than the price. And when I look at the green area, this is where the opportunity is. What I want is to place the largest rectangle uh, in this uh, space. For example, if I uh, price the product at two, then my revenue is just the area, which is one. If I price at one, my revenue is one. And so since I have two products, my total revenue is What happens if uh, I suggest these two products as a bundle? So remember, if I price them independently, the revenue is two. What if I uh, price them as a bundle? Well, if I price them as a bundle, the, the valuations can be either two with probability of one quarter, three with probability of one half, or four with probability of one quarter. So if I price a product at three, I will sell with probability of three over four. My expected revenue is nine over four, greater than what I would have gotten if I sold them independently. And that is really a magic. This is a completely independent product, but bundling allows me to increase um, revenue. And you can see it on the graph on the right hand side. Um, by placing the largest possible uh, rectangle into this space, I get uh, uh, a revenue of 9 over 4. Uh, what the key observation here that I'm going to use uh, in different way later on is that bundling allows us to take advantage of concentrations of customers around the mean. What does this mean? If I have many products and I look at sum of XI, sum of devaluation, we know that the sum of devaluation are concentrated around the mean. I want to take advantage of this, of this observation. So, uh, a lot of work has been done around bundling, uh, bundling in both economics and computer science. What is known is that bundling is revenue maxi uh, maximizing when there are many independent products that are costless. Think about uh, IT products, right? No cost. A lot of times they are independent, that's where the opportunity is. And the reason for that is if I have, for example, three uh, products that I sell independently, like so, when I focus on bundle, I need to generate the convolution, and therefore I can take advantage of the entire consumer system. Right. Uh, that's really the opportunity. This is classical result. But what was also known, and that's a problem for online retailers, is that cost kill bundles. Since bundling forced customers whose valuation is better than cost not to buy the product. Right? And the idea is illustrated in this slide very well. When there is a cost, I shift the graph that I showed you to the left. The red area represents all the customers whose valuation is lower than the cost. These customers are not going to buy the product. When I use the convolution, I have very little uh, opportunity to maximize revenue, it's not going to work very well. And the recommendation typically in the literature, forget about bundling when you have cost. Here is uh, what we uh, suggest. Um, what if we change? We tell the customer they can buy the bundle, but return any product for a refund of cost. Meaning any product where the valuation is less than the cost, they can return and we, the process seller, will refund it for a cost. We call this uh, algorithm or this idea pure bundling with disposal for cost or PBDC. On this graph, what it means is that because you don't have to accept 
a product, if the valuation is less than the cost, then I can remove the land area. When I do the convolution, I have more opportunities to maximize revenue, and all of a sudden, we have a new way to capture revenue under bundles when there is a cost. It turns out that some of the retailers are actually using this algorithm. In fact, uh, if you uh, look at what happens in the market, uh, there are two ways to implement the algorithm that I just described. One is, think about this as a tariff or membership form. This is really Costco strategy. To be a client of Costco, you have to pay membership fee, and then they charge you for cost. This is exactly our algorithm. This is exactly the bundling algorithm that I just described. Right? The second way is when you have a discount. The way discount works, and we see it all around us, is I sell this three product at uh, different prices, but the bundle strategy says take any two, you save 20 bucks, any three, you save 40 bucks, any four, you save 60 bucks. This kind of implementation is exactly the algorithm that I just showed. So three ways to implement the algorithm, two of them are what online and non-online retailers are using when they think about bundling. Now, the question, of course, is how good it is. And here we look at uh, a couple of point of views. The computer science point of view that look at worst case, and uh, economics and OM point of view that look at practical data. Right? So let me start with uh, worst case. Um, if you look at the computer science literature, what is known in the computer science, uh, science literature, if there is no cost, Worst case of simple algorithm is about one or it's not about it's exactly one over six. We show with or without cost you can do a little bit uh, better, right? You can improve the worst case uh, bound, but more importantly, with data similar to what we saw in practice, we get 97 to 99 percent of the optimum, right? Which is really encouraging for companies that have an opportunity to sell independent product as a bundle. Think about, for example, um, a dealer selling cars and can offer, or an OEM selling cars and can offer different features. A lot of times the features are completely independent of each other. Like it's one type of engine with different types of dashboard. The, the valuations, the dependent, independent of each other, this is where I have an opportunity to offer bundles with a great uh, impact. The, the second um, observation I want to make is that bundles allow us to uh, learn about consumer valuation with zero change in price. And so let me illustrate this with uh, the following example. Suppose I sell this product for 10 cents and half of the people buy uh, uh, the product. Uh, the question is what is their valuation? Uh, well, the only thing I can say, if half of the people vote, is that 50% have valuation greater than 10 and 50% have valuation less than 10, but I don't know whether the valuations are concentrated, in which case a small change in price will have a big impact, or they are displaced, in which case a small change in price will have no impact. And so it's hard to say anything without changing the price. However, when you have bundles, you can uh, reverse engineer and figure out what, uh, what the valuations are. And let me show this with an example of two products. Suppose I'm selling two independent products at a price of 10 cents each. If there is no bundle, then there are really four uh, regions in this diagram where X1 represents the valuation for product one, X2 the valuation for product two. This region represented by most product, uh, by none is here, and the other two is by a single item. And, and like we said, if there is no uh, bundle, I can't say anything more than that, right? But suppose I offer um, these two items also as a bundle, and I give a discount of two if you buy both. Let's see what happened to the buy both region. All of a sudden, the buy both region uh, increases by this uh, square of two by two. 
This square has a big impact. Because if I realize that half of the people bought box product and half bought none, then I know because of the independent assumption that they have to be concentrated in this square, as a result, I can reverse engineer exactly the parameter of the distribution. Suppose, for example, that it's not 50-50, but it's everywhere. Then I know that the valuations have to be in this square, and I can reverse engineer from this square what the true valuation is. And so what we show is that you can uh, infer the distribution, and we have an iterative algorithm that basically tell us what the true valuation is with zero price experimentation. And so uh, let me uh, um, conclude and then acknowledge uh, the people who worked on, on this project. Um, to me, uh, a big opportunity that we have here is associated with the three example, examples that uh, Philippe Caro uh, discussed during the award ceremony. Um, it's all, in my opinion, about the future of OM. I think, I think that, that we need more and more to emphasize data driven, not only in research, even in teaching. Um, today, my experience is there is very little uh, reliance on data in formulating models and identifying research opportunities. And, and the problem is the systems that we analyze involve people. How do you predict behavior if you don't have any data about behavior? My um, experience is that um, data driven uh, allow us to develop um, both new engineering methods, new scientific methods that uh, explain behavior, predict behavior, and hopefully I convince you through a couple of examples, change behavior. Um, of course, we, uh, some of us are very lucky to be able to work with companies and to get data and to generate insight. But not everybody has that uh, opportunity, and I would say especially a young uh, faculty and I think part of the responsibility of uh, senior faculty who have stood here, like uh, Chris Tang and uh, Philip Caro and, my, and myself and others, is, is to really develop an open uh, source data repository that anybody can use to uh, develop new insights and new models that make, uh, that make a difference. Um, I, I want to just uh, conclude with um, acknowledgement. Um, the story of Ulala was done with my former PhD student, Chris Johnson, who is on the faculty now at HBS. The Groupon story was done with two PhD students who are graduating now. He one is going to be a faculty at Georgia Tech, ISYE. Uh, one Chi has been sponsored generously by uh, the Singapore government, so he's going back to Singapore. And the bundling work was done with a current PhD student, uh, Will Ma. Thank you uh, very much, and I don't know if you Thank you, Emilia. Thank you for about a couple of questions that the audience wants to ask. We exceeded our time, so I think I think we can work. Okay. Well, uh, I just want to uh, uh, extend our sincere gratitude and thanks to Professor Hilary for this writing talk. Thank you very much. Professor.